Um, so I just want to cover off a couple of things today and then I'm happy to take questions uh, at the end of the session. So a lot of it you will have heard uh, parts of through the day, so I'll, I'll skip over bits we've already covered um, uh, where I can. So just cover quickly who the task force is. The task force is focused on sediment, how we came to be discussing this topic. Um, the draft vision itself, um, maybe picking up from where Ted started, talk a bit about community engagement and the importance of that. Um, and, and then how we might move forward from here, so implementing the final vision once that's landed and if it's accepted. Um, just by way of introduction, I'm the Dept Secretary of Transport and Infrastructure, uh, is my day job. There was a CEO of ITAS uh, who had carriage and involvement with the task force originally who retired and I ended up jumping into uh, that space at about February last year. So I'm thinking already, I wish this session had been in about February the 15th last year because it would have saved me a lot of time and effort in getting up to speed on issues. Anyway. So who's the task force? So it was established in 2017. I really picked up again from where Ted started on this idea of the challenge of the commons. So where you've got a, you know, a, a shared uh, asset or public good, uh, how uh, a number of different disciplines would say that that uh, good won't be looked after as well as if it was in single custodian's hands. So um, the task force is made up of a, a range of groups with a key interest in the Tamar across, uh, you've got there two levels of government in local government and state government, but also the Commonwealth are an observer on the uh, task force and it's the same people who are involved in the Launceston City deal. And then we have a number of key entities uh, that have a direct uh, engagement like your TAS Waters and Hydros and NRMs um, and also the EPA obviously who has a very keen interest in this waterway. So, um, when the task force, uh, so when the first task force, or when I first became involved with the task force, um, the River Health Action Plan was really the main point of discussion and a lot of really good work had been done and there was a high level of agreement to where that needed to go, but some of the mechanics weren't in place, so the funding agreements, to activate those programs that had already been announced were not resolved between Commonwealth, state and local governments and state and NRM. And if for anyone who's had uh, experience working with the Commonwealth, uh, which I have a lot of in my day job, um, what you can find is funding being in a budget or even being announced by a minister does not mean it is released. It can be a long way from being released. So you can find yourself in a situation where people are saying, why aren't you getting on with stuff, but the funding isn't yet actually released, even though it's in a budget. So that's where, um, that's where the tempt found itself and Taswater and NRM respectively in the front end of last year. And we worked through, uh, we worked through those issues and got some funding arrangements uh, up and rolling. So, um, that took us through to about the middle of the year and we started to have, and I think the, the group was working as you would want that group to work in a fairly collaborative and respectful way. So, so active discussion around some challenging issues but ultimately we were finding that we could land positions as a group, I think it's fair to say. So that led to well, what, where else should we be focusing our efforts and inevitably the issue of sediment came up and I have to say that there was at least one uh, task force member uh, who felt somewhat nervous about taking this um, challenge on because it is absolutely in the category of wicked problem. Um, so from everything we've seen today, if this was an easy problem, <laughs> I'm, I'm looking at uh, uh, Mary in, in relation to the photos, uh, but if this was an easy problem, it wouldn't still be, talk, be talked about some 170, 180 years um, from when it was first raised. It's a highly complex problem. It's, I, I mean, it's scientifically complex, we've heard some of that today, but it's also really complex in terms of getting some coalescence of ideas or agreement to solution, solutions, so it's complex in, in all ways. So um, the task force had a discussion and, and said, well, we really need to have a good um, backdrop of understanding or the best backdrop of understanding that we can have around this before we launch into the sediment um, policy space. So, and that was the genesis of the tier program report, which 
uh, Rebecca and others have talked to, which was a major piece of work um, and a really important piece of work to inform the work that the attempt has subsequently done. Um, and the really, as, as other speakers have talked to, that report was meant to inform, inform the policy work that the attempt would then go on to do. I think I'll skip over this next slide because Joe pretty much covered this um, um, in her discussion. I guess all I'll say is the attempt uh, is effectively a, an applied policy and uh, investment uh, advisory body. So what I mean by that is it's not um, there to give um, uh, uh, conceptual or esoteric policy advice, it's there to give advice that then transacts into action in some form, whether that be the River Health Action Plan or now through into sediment management. But it relies on the tier for that scientific uh, input which is vitally important. So the tier report, I think um, a lot of what's on this slide really um, you've heard about today. So um, it, it, it really acknowledges some of the history around uh, the challenges with this issue. As Rebecca talked about, it looks at and examines a lot of the myths around this issue. Um, and while I think since it's been released, there are, you know, it, there's no, um, I think in my mind, possibility of settling every element of a scientific debate around a complex issue like this, but it's certainly uh, contributed to a greater level of um, common view, I think, which is really important. Um, having a number of um, uh, life scientists in my family, I think the con um, contestability of ideas is a really important part of science moving forward, so uh, you wouldn't expect it to settle every argument, but it certainly has drawn together a lot of the thinking pulled it into one place, challenged some of the myths and created a new baseline for us to consider as the task force. But it's not the whole story, the, the science. So the other part that the task force has been talking about really comes back to where Ted began today, which is to implement, to arrive at policy and implement policy, you need a few other things in place. So you need a level of community support for the proposed direction. So I think there's plenty for everyone here who has followed the news, there's plenty of examples in Tasmania where both good ideas and bad ideas have not progressed because they don't have social licence. So you can come up with examples across forestry, um, more recently fishing and mining, but there's lots of examples where projects that you, you know every person in this room would have an opinion on whether they're good or bad have not progressed because they've lacked social licence. So the task force had some discussions around the perceptions and views of the wider community are also really important in providing some advice to governments, which is ultimately the TEMP's role. Um, and that sort of translates, picking up again a couple of things, Rebecca said, some of the, so while the tier report ex has explained, and for the non-science based members of TEMP like me, um, uh, provide a deeper understanding about the extent to which sediment is a natural process in the ecosystem and important, um, it doesn't change the fact that a lot of people in the community still don't like it. Um, so that's also been a consideration for the attempt. Now of course, um, things don't always go exactly to plan. So as we were working through this process, the plan had been that we'd settle the tier report, it would go through a proper scientific review and be finalised, uh, and then we would use that as a key input into, into uh, developing some policy advice for different levels of government. But there was an election in the middle of all that, and it wouldn't surprise you that the election timing didn't have a whole lot of regard to where the tempt and tier processes were at in terms of their journey. So through that election, um, under the caretaking conventions, you, you're not able to give policy advice to an incumbent government because um, that gives the incumbent government an advantage over um, the opposition. So really the policy process is suspended during that period. And during that process the government made some various commitments around the state and some of those were around dredging uh, in the Tamar, so some short term dredging. Um, and also uh, there's a further commitment around looking at the structure of the attempt and working out what best structure, what structure will best suit uh, moving forward. 
So on the other side of the election, what we've done is the TEMT has picked up the election commitment as a given, so it's not providing advice on whether it's good or bad, and just said, how can we incorporate that or can we incorporate that into a broader work program to recommend to government? So the dredging, but it is important to differentiate the dredging that's been discussed. And we're actually working through this right now, uh, including with Ken and other um, stakeholders who have a direct interest in this. So it's very targeted dredging for a defined period of time at low volumes to connect a particular um, entity to the main recreational channel. It's not the kind of broad scale dredging that we've been talking about uh, earlier today. I think it would be fair to say that the work we've done since the election um, is consistent with the tier report. So the tier report identifies dredging as challenging and that the regulatory framework around it has changed materially. So where that's taking us at the moment is to look at uh, dredge spoils going out to sea is a 18 to 24 month process that might may not be possible at the end of it and is associated with larger volumes. So dredging a port. Um, for example. Um, releasing uh, dredge spoils into the river is probably not compatible with, with modern uh, regulatory uh, processes, So, uh, which leaves you with a land-based dredging solution and looking at um, the silt ponds on the western side of the Tamar. So I guess we're still working through that and we need to talk to the intended beneficiaries of that dredging program, but the message I'm really saying is I think that is a fixed term interaction. It's um, it's not it's not the long term solution. So, so that's been happening. Um, so in that context, armed with this scientific uh, understanding and also uh, considering the election commitments that have been made, then the temp set about um, arriving at a draft vision again with the intent of going out to community and seeking a level of support for that vision because uh, it'll be very difficult to progress what is effectively a discretionary spend for all three levels of government without some level of community support. So, and we've tried to take into account both what people perceive to be important and also think about the science. So um, that's uh, picking up the theme that we've heard during the day that I think the attempt uh, I don't think it's in a written policy anywhere, but the Thames have had a lot of discussions about working with nature, not against nature, um, but also talked about uh, expectations of community. So in June 21, uh, we started the first phase of consultation around a draft vision. Oh, and the other thing I should say about the vision before I go into it is a couple of uh, considerations uh, around it. Um, is it practically implementable. So a lot of the time if you're giving advice you know, into government, there, you can give advice that goes, we're in state A and it'd be great if we can get to state B. But if you can't describe how you're going to go from state A to state B, there's a good chance that the government won't accept your advice. Um, so you have to be able to show that it's practical and implementable. So we have thought about that and the scalability around the infrastructure solutions is one element of that. Um, and the other, the other element is looking for areas where people could agree to, to solution sets. So instead of focusing on the areas where we disagree, say are there areas where we could potentially agree? Because again, if you're making proposals to government to support a vision and then fund things, it's easier for them to do that if they've got a level of, um, uh, a level of agreement behind what they've been asked to do. So. Uh, so really what the draft vision has is two elements that fit together. So one was the first is looking at a cultural and recreational precinct, which is really the idea of picking up the, uh, the rehabilitation or natural processes around vegetation that were identified in the tier report and marrying that with some infrastructure concepts that improve um, the use of the river. So, um, and also the thought was to connect existing uh, assets and strengths of Launceston. So we've had a look at that, but as I go through this and just responding to, I think, an issue Ken raised, all the infrastructure treatments are illustrative. They're not actual, they're not actual proposed treatments. So if the draft vision, uh, once finalised, is accepted by governments, then the attempt will give some thought to how you come up with the actual solutions. And there's a few different ways we could do that. One would be through competitive um, 
community process, but we'll give more thought to that, you know, sort of step by step once the vision is is landed. So that that priority one is thinking about the next two to five years, and part of working with community and getting support will be to be able to show some dem demonstrable improvement for some of the things that some of the stakeholders care about. So for the business community and for property owners, the aesthetic is important to them, and being able to access the river. Um, you know, for recreation and family events is also important. But it doesn't deal with all the problems. I acknowledge that there are some specific uh, recreational st uh, stakeholders who this does not address their concerns. And the other priority was looking at uh, long-term sustainable management. So this is tying into the advice from TIA. Um, I'll come back to that. Which um, was really a, a working off the science of the tidal prism. So where could we um, uh, use the natural processes of the river to address some of the um, um, sediment outcomes that are the, the, that are the uh, byproduct of interventions from humans over the last 200 years? So I think the minister, as a minister, talked more eloquently than I can about the idea of the priority one. So that is really trying to engage the community on what might be. So it's not, so that's why I say those drawings are very illustrative. And what we're asking people through the consultation process is to say, what are your, uh, what are your thoughts and ideas on what might be? And what would make you want to spend more time, you know, and use and live uh, with this river? So that can, I'm not sure if you can see this well, but that can sound a bit, you know, superficial. But again, if you come back to people's perceptions are important, there's a lot of people for whom the aesthetic is important. So there are a few examples of some of the transformations that have happened in other waterfronts. So this one's Brisbane. Um, let me go to the next one. This one's maybe a little bit more dramatic, Chicago. And maybe I'll pause there. And I think one thing I find interesting about these slides, particularly there's a couple on the left compared to the one in the very centre, is uh, you've got potentially uh, an outcome there where the social use of the waterfront is better. Um, the economic property values and commercial opportunities around the river, you would assume, are superior in the left-hand slide to the central side. And you've also created an environment where people, you would think, would care a lot about the river and want it not to be uh, degraded through th further environmental pollution. So I guess the point being is some of this stuff, which you could say is superficial, can also dovetail into a long-term solution. These are some of the concepts that were developed uh, for, the, for the attempt, working with Launceston City Council. But again, you know, don't take them as literal. So. Um, we've had some discussions um, uh, in relation to the picture on the left and there's different views on that but there's also a lot of interest in uh, the priority two which might actually remove the need to, to do that particular treatment. The picture on the right is sort of showing this combination of accelerated natural revegetation combined with some uh, infrastructure treatments to provide accessibility and the little decking area at the front is an example of a solution which might provide some commercial opportunities for people in that space. So in, in, you'd all recognise the locations but again um, one of the things that we've thought about is the existing position of Launceston. So in this case the public art that's depicted in the top slide is really thinking about how you might connect in and leverage with QV Mag and some of the cultural um, uh, backdrop of Launceston in, current form, in its current form, and also how you might connect different areas. This is over the other side of the river and a similar concept. Now, one of the questions that has been asked around these kind of infrastructure treatments is, well, what about flood management? So I, I think, as many people would be aware, typically with any infrastructure, it'll be designed to a standard and there has to be a decision around uh, what level of security you want. So for some infrastructure, you might say, if I look at that, uh, a public art um, 
uh, example in the top corner, you might be prepared to say there's a one in 10 or one in 20 year event that will, that will damage that piece of infrastructure. There might be other infrastructure, and in the case of um, say a major uh, bridge project, where you say we have an incredibly low tolerance uh, to any damage to that infrastructure. So they're usually designed to a, in a, to a standard that is anywhere between one in 100 to one in 2000 um, event tolerance, depending on what the infrastructure is, and we'd have to work through all that. It brings me to priority two, which is more the long term. So priority one, we're thinking sort of if it gets funded, you know, two to five years kind of window for some uh, improvement. Priority two, um, a longer term, so five, ten years and beyond. And really this is again trying to pick up on the area where there is a fair degree of agreement between the scientific voices in the debate, which is there seems to be a, um, which there seems to be around that um, wetland restoration and levee removal up the North Esk. And that's what this is really getting at. So um, the question I think that we'd like input through the consultation on is the scale of and ambitiousness of priority two. So priority two, as identified in the tier report, can be relatively modest, uh, which is the which would be focusing on public land, um, and that um, would have some effect on the um, uh, uh, visualisation of uh, sediment and where it's located and dispersed, um, but less than if you did a larger scale program that involved public and private land. So this will be, um, I guess, informed by what level of support we get through for this initiative through the consultation. And then if it is adopted by government, we will explore the scale that is supported effectively. Um, so that could mean um, public land or it could mean also uh, interacting with private sector interests and seeing if they're willing to make that land available or sell that land for restoration. Uh, so turning to the process really, so what we've gone through to date is the first stage of a consultation. So um, uh, that's involved a, an online um, survey process where we've sought feedback from people and a, a kind of um, staged process. So the first stage we've just finished, um, we'll now look at some of what the, some of that feedback is, um, then play back to the community some of what we've heard, um, look to uh, work through that process by the end of October so we can give some advice to government by the end of this year. Now. Um, probably not going to write this down, but it wouldn't surprise anybody in the room that we are thinking about the timing of a federal election in, in putting that process together. Um, so another thing that's um, perhaps not obvious if you don't deal with this stuff regularly, but um, a lot of, so this uh, lends itself well to an all three levels of government solution. So I think you know government could spend governments could spend time pointing at each other, um, but given it's already going to be challenging to get a level of community agreement to any solution, it's going to be easier if the three governments are lined up and working in the same direction, whatever their different whether their persuasions are the same or different. Um, but also uh, in the federal uh, world, um, funding tends to be very tightly specified. So if you're working, um, you know, so you might have a project that is a really good project but it doesn't fit the bucket. One of the things with the city deals is they are a bit wider than, um, than most other federal arrangements. So you can come up with a set of ideas that meet a problem definition and that can be funded by the federal government and state government and ideally local government as well. So this is sort of targeting a city deal extension of Launceston and thinking about the electoral cycle as well. Um, in the online stuff we've done, we've used a thing called Pinpoint where you can actually identify um, uh, an area, a geographic area within the area that's been looked at and you can make your suggestions. So, um, and that's a thing that's done pretty widely now on transport projects because what we found historically is if you go out with the description of a, 
uh, a vision or a, or a project, what you'll draw out is the people who are critical of it. What you don't hear from is the people who are supportive of it. Or you also don't tend to get the uh, variations of it that are really constructive and helpful. So we're trying to elicit uh, a wider set of voices through this process. So, so far we've had about 1,700 visits to the, to the website and 100 survey responses and approximately 30 ideas or comments. So that's not a bad start and we'll hope to elicit a bit more engagement as we go through the second phase of consultation where we play back some of the ideas that we've heard and then test them, see how they resonate with a broader, broader range of people. Um, so how would this sort of go forward? So um, once we get through the consultation, we'll pull all that together and bring it back to TEMPT. TEMPT will go through then and finalise some advice that it will put uh, to the state government. So TEMPT was originally brought together or initiated by a state government initiative. Um, but then it, then, it will, um, uh, then it will need to progress into a funding discussion pretty quickly uh, so that we can translate hopefully that vision into some level of action. So in relation to the first priority, the infrastructure treatments, I guess one of the things I'd say about that is they're scalable. So if you have, you know, $25 million, you can do one version of that. If you have $5 million, you can do another version. And if you do the $5 million version, it doesn't stop you doing some more work the next year or the year after that or the year after that. Um, so again, um, that vision doesn't really rule out. There's other long-term ideas and I think, I don't think I've talked to a single person in this process who hasn't put an idea forward with good intent. Um, but this doesn't rule out a lot of those ideas. What it says is, here's where we should start and does the community support that? There will of course be a lot of work. So um, if that vision gets up and we get it funding, then you move into a delivery phase. And then that's what will come back to tempt off, how might we do that? So. Um, um, uh, then you're into the normal sort of procurement processes and framing up programs and projects. So I would expect if we can get through the vision stage this year, then we'll have a one to two year framing process to get projects specified to the level that you can put them out to market to be delivered. Um, and that's hopefully uh, the path that we can go down. But the first step will be get that draft vision in a form that is um, uh, suitable to put to government.